China holds up Blinken's travel to Beijing over spy balloon. U.S. sanctions two Chinese chemical firms for producing illicit fentanyl intended for Americans. U.S. climate chief, China should help cover costs of global warming. Beijing releases video describing all-out attack on Taiwan, only making the U.S. more determined. China is now rejecting Secretary of State Antony Blinken from paying a visit to its capital even as the U.S. is ready to resume the trip, which was canceled earlier this year over the presence of a Chinese spy balloon. According to the Financial Times, Beijing is unwilling to reinstate the key diplomatic trip over the incoming FBI report about the balloon, with four people familiar with the talk saying it is worried about how the Biden administration would respond. China is anxious that the FBI report might be unveiled during Blinken's visit to China, which could include physical evidence about the controversial balloon. It has insisted that the balloon happened to be in the continent only by chance. Washington, however, argued that the flying object had loitered over sensitive zones. Its detection came just a few days before Blinken was to board for Beijing, resulting in the cancellation of the trip in February. Three people said China's foreign minister, Qin Gang, brought up the issue with the U.S. attendees at the China Development Forum in Beijing in March. Chin reportedly said that FBI investigation was another instance of the issues that have hindered the stabilization of U.S.-China relations. The comment ignored how the crisis began in the presence of the Chinese object in the first place. Recent engagements between U.S. lawmakers and Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen are another reason behind Beijing's reluctance to Blinken's visit. The most recent is the meeting between House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and Tsai, which Beijing responded to with three days of military exercises and combat readiness patrols around the island. Blinken's drop-in was meant to be an important opportunity for both governments to interact on the range of issues such as commerce, human rights, climate change, and regional security. Dennis Wilder a former Asia advisor to George W. Bush, commented, In many ways, we are more eager for this visit than they are. They don't have the incentive to make this visit happen quickly. In that sense, for the Chinese, the downsides of waiting are not great. The U.S. imposed sanctions on two entities based in China, accusing them of providing precursor chemicals to drug cartels in Mexico for the illicit fentanyl production targeting the U.S. market. The Treasury Department announced the sanctions on China-based chemical firms Wuhan Suokang Biological Technology and Suzhou Xiaoli Pharmatech. It also designated five people in the inducement, including four Chinese nationals. The Treasury's Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Brian Nelson, said illicit fentanyl is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans each year. Treasury, as part of the whole-of-government effort to respond to this crisis, will continue to vigorously apply our tools to prevent the transfer or precursor to chemicals and machinery necessary to produce this drug. Earlier this month, a federal grand jury in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York indicted three of the four Chinese nationals on conspiracy charges, including fentanyl importation and money laundering. As a result of the sanctions, all assets of the designated individuals and entities must be blocked. The move from the Treasury Department is part of an effort to crack down on the trafficking of illicit drugs into the U.S. These drugs cause tens of thousands of American deaths each year. This week, the U.S. and Mexico agreed to intensify the fight against fentanyl trafficking. In recent weeks, both nations have asked the Chinese regime for its support to restrict precursor chemicals shipping from coming from the Asian country. In an interview on April 16th, the U.S. climate director said that China should contribute financially to help poorer nations suffering from the effects of global warming, since it is the top annual carbon emitter. John Kerry, the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, told Nikkei Asia, if you can help humanity to save lives and have a fair solution to this challenge, we need to all be part of that for sure. In response to calls for developed countries like the U.S., the top historical emitter, to assist offset climate damages, he argued that any country with a very large economy that is able to contribute in some way should do so. For example, China's economy is the second largest in the world. The former foreign minister and presidential candidate gave the interview while he was in the northern Japanese city of Sapporo, where he attended a two-day meeting of the group of seven climate ministers that had ended a few hours earlier. 
nearly 200 nations decided to create a fund to provide financial assistance to less developed countries suffering from the effects of climate change, such as extreme flooding and crumbling coastlines, at the annual United Nations Climate Change Conference in Egypt last November. The idea that wealthy, industrialized nations should pay for the environmental costs of their development, in addition to reducing emissions, was opposed for roughly three decades by the United States and other developed economies like the European Union. They were concerned that taking ownership would open the door to legal liabilities. However, Kerry stated on Sunday that his nation supported the creation of the fund and was committed to ironing out the specifics, such as how much money must be raised. Kerry claimed that the U.S. and China were talking about the environment. However, he added that he is still concerned that other matters might obstruct those negotiations, as diplomatic tensions between the two biggest emitters increase. Highlighting human responsibility toward climate change, he said, We all have to try to make thoughtful judgments about what's good for humanity, what is good for the world, what is good for the planet in terms of the climate. He added, How do we fix things? And how do we do this in a way that we're all sharing responsibility? China's People Liberation Army, PLA, has recently raised regional tensions by demonstrating it's preparing to attack and smash Taiwan. It even released an animated video depicting how it would launch a full-scale attack on Taiwan. The video was initially posted on the PLA Eastern Theater Command's WeChat account and later on the Global Times Twitter account. It shows a barrage of missiles launched from China's coast and the Taiwan Strait. The main tactic depicted in the video is indiscriminate bombing, including a burning strategy designed to destroy Taiwan's defenses. On April 10th, the PLA completed a three-day large-scale combat readiness patrol, a military exercise simulating a complete blockade of Taiwan. Military experts said these exercises serve as a bold threat and an opportunity for the PLA to practice their tactics for blocking Taiwan's sea and air traffic. This time, the PLA's military drills appeared to focus more on air power and air strikes. According to Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense, 70 PLA fighter jets were detected from 6 a.m. on April 9th to 6 a.m. on April 10th with half crossing Taiwan's median line. On April 7th and 8th, eight PLA warships and 71 fighter jets and armed jets were spotted near Taiwan. On April 10th, the PLA announced its aircraft carrier Shandong had participated in a drill simulating a blockade of Taiwan for the first time. However, the U.S. met the Chinese Communist Party CCP's intimidation and fierce threat with a strong counterattack. It aggressively encircled Taiwan, and the U.S. 7th Fleet announced its guided missile destroyer, USS Milius, sailed near Mischief Reef to the east of the Changsha Islands and indicated that it was a freedom of navigation operation. Previously, the PLA built and militarized an artificial island on a reef in the South China Sea. The CCP claims vast swaths of the South China Sea and the waters, although the U.S. disputes those claims. The U.S. Navy 7th Fleet said in a statement, Unlawful and sweeping maritime claims in the South China Sea pose a serious threat to the freedom of the seas, including the freedoms of navigation and overflight, free trade and unimpeded commerce, and freedom of economic opportunity for South China Sea littoral nations. It continued, by engaging in normal operations within 12 nautical miles of Mischief Reef, the United States demonstrated that vessels can lawfully exercise high seas freedoms in those areas. And the United States upholds freedom of navigation for all nations and a principle, as long as some countries continue to claim and assert limits on rights that exceed their authority under the international law, the United States will continue to defend the rights and freedoms of the sea guaranteed to all. CCP threat of force only firms up our resolve. On April 10th, Mike Gallagher, chairman of the House Select Committee on China, told AP News he plans to lead his committee to shore up the Taiwan government's defenses, encouraging U.S. Congress to expedite military aid to Taiwan. Regarding the CCP's growing threat of force against Taiwan, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall told Fox News, These are intimidation tactics and saber-rattling, in my judgment, only firm up our resolve against the Chinese Communist Party. It has no deterrent effect on us. In fact, I think it galvanizes the United States' support for Taiwan. U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy recently met with Taiwanese President Tsing Ing-wen. Soon after, Michael McCall led a bipartisan U.S. congressional delegation to visit Taiwan. McCall revealed during a closed press conference that the group had discussed weapon sales, stressed that the U.S. backs deterrence policies. He noted that combining training, military exercises, and intelligence sharing remain central to U.S. efforts to support Taiwan. 